Before we start reading, got to understand right here in this moment of history, Jesus has now come to earth. He lived an awesome life, a sinless life. He did amazing signs, wonders, and miracles. He's died on a cross. He's risen again from the dead. He's revealed himself to many people. He has showed uh, himself to hundreds of people now that he is, in fact, alive, just as he said he would be. And uh, now he is about to leave his disciples and his friends. He's about to ascend back into heaven on a cloud. And uh, as he's approaching this moment, Jesus tells his friends that he is going to leave them, but they're actually not going to be alone because he's going to leave them with the person of the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, right? Marissa was unpacking that beautifully for us a few minutes ago. But please understand this as we approach the Holy Spirit tonight and as we kind of unpack some of this, understand this, the Holy Spirit is not some lesser version of God. Okay, that's, that's not, like, like, let me deconstruct. I don't know what everyone's church background is, or maybe you have no church background, right? And so tonight we're going to take a look at a few things, but the Holy Spirit is not a lesser version of God. The Holy Spirit is not some bench warmer version of God. It wasn't like Jesus was the first round pick, and now that he has to go, now we're going to throw in our second choice. Like, that's, that's not how it is. In fact, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right, the God that we serve, one God, three persons, this is what we believe. Uh, there is no hierarchy amongst them. They all exalt one another, right? They, they, there's never been a moment that the three of them have ever been in disagreement. They never left staff meeting together, and one said, yeah, I didn't really agree with the other one today, you know, and I'm going to do my own thing. Like, like the Holy Spirit is God. I think a lot of us have this uh, misconception. It's like in, in our heads, it, we see this imagery and it's almost like we perceive that like the Father, he's like up in heaven and he's sitting on this big throne and then Jesus gets like a little throne off to the right and the Holy Spirit doesn't even get a throne because he just floats around. That would be an improper view of the Holy Spirit, right? One God, three persons, that's who we serve. And so we're gonna pick up our reading right here in Acts chapter one, starting in verse four says this on one occasion while he was eating with them speaking of Jesus he gave them this command do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift everyone say gift wait for the gift that my father promised first thing you need to know tonight I don't know we have a lot of note takers in the room you need to understand this the Holy Spirit is a gift it's a gift he is a gift and I think the Holy Spirit is a gift that far too many believers never stop to fully unpack like, like when you think about it, it, it would be like having a gift wrapped under the tree on the morning of December the 25th, and it has your name on it, but you're not opening it up. That would be ridiculous. You're going to want to tear into that. All right? It's, it's going to be good for you, okay? And the same is true about the Holy Spirit. He's only ever helping you. You're going to want to unpack this individual, this person of the Holy Spirit, right? Because we're going to see tonight there are a lot of benefits to him being at work in your life. This is a gift, the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you're gonna be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time gonna restore uh, the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now I want you to take a right in your Bible, go to the next chapter, Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two, and it says this, when the day of Pentecost came, everyone say Pentecost. Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now what's interesting about Pentecost, we actually just passed that on our church calendar a few weeks ago, back, back in May, right? We celebrated uh, Pentecost. We celebrated this moment of the coming of the Holy Spirit that's represented right here in Acts chapter two. But let me just take you through like a, a, a little bit of Jesus in these key moments of his life to help you see something real quick. So if you go all the way back to the beginning, we first see Jesus show up in a town called Bethlehem, right? He's born as a baby in a manger in a barn, right? You know, there's angels and there's shepherds and there's wise men. We've all seen the nativity scene, all right? We get it, right? Bethlehem, right? One of the first names that Jesus has ever given is the name Emmanuel. At Bethlehem, we are, we are seen, the world realizes God is now with us. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. Fast forward to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. He's at a cross at a place called Calvary. At Calvary, we, we realize and we get a revelation that God's not just with us, but God is for us. At Calvary, he died for us us. But now here we are at Pentecost. Jesus has now ascended. He's sending the person of the Holy Spirit. And at Pentecost, we find out that not only can God be with us and for us, but now he's God in us. 
Now, for you and I sitting in 2021, like, if we grew up in church, a lot of us are like, oh, yeah, I mean, we, we knew that. Like, I, I understand. I can receive Jesus into my heart. The Holy Spirit comes. He lives in my heart. Like, he's, he's in me. But you got to take yourself back to the first century of these people in the upper room. This is the first time ever in their entire lives that a generation of people are understanding that this God that we love, this Jesus, that we have been following, this ministry, this miracle working power, it can actually live in me. It can live in me. Like, this is brand new to them. You and I sit back and we're like, man, I, you know, got Jesus in my heart, feels good. Like, th this is revolutionary for them in this moment that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, can be within me. Verse 2, it says, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Has anyone ever heard this verse before? Right? A sound. Sorry. I preached multiple services yesterday, and my throat is destroyed. So, uh, pray we make it through tonight. The Bible says there's a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. It came from heaven. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. So, I had this thought. Who all's in the room when this sound shows up, right? The Holy Spirit's coming. Jesus made a promise. He's delivering on this promise. And the Holy Spirit shows up, and the Bible says there's this sound. Who's in the room? We know disciples are in the room. They're definitely in the room. We know there's probably some other friends of Jesus that are in the room. We know women are in the room. Uh, women were the first one on the scene at the tomb to realize that Jesus was not there. Um, so there's a lot of people in the room, but I had this thought, you know who's in the room? Peter's in the room. We know Peter's in the room because in the next chapter, Peter leaves the room. He goes out into the street. He starts preaching, and 3,000 people get saved on day one. We know Peter's in the room. Right, And so there's this sound that comes, but I thought, you know, Peter's in the room, and, and, and a few weeks ago, Peter heard a different sound, and it was not an encouraging sound. See, I imagine that the sound of the Holy Spirit is an encouraging sound. I, I would imagine it's a positive sound. It's probably a faith-increasing sound, this sound of the Holy Spirit. But a few weeks back, Peter heard a different sound that was not an encouraging sound. In fact, it was a negative sound. It was a, it was a sound that brought guilt and shame and condemnation on his life. Maybe you already know what I'm talking about. It was the sound of that rooster. If you know your Bible, you know that there was this moment when Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Peter, uh, even before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And at first Peter thought, man, there's no way. But yet, sure enough, Jesus is right. Peter denies him three times and then this rooster crows. And as soon as Peter hears the rooster, he is filled with guilt. He's filled with shame. He is filled with condemnation. How could I have been so dumb? Why did I deny him like that? How could I be so stupid to deny Jesus that way? All of these thoughts are flooding his mind. All this guilt, all this shame because of this sound. Now, I've been on a lot of missions trips before. I don't know if you've ever been to many third world countries, but here's what I know about other countries around the world. Roosters and chickens are everywhere. They're everywhere. Like in America, if you want to see one, you got to search out to find one. Like in a third world nation, it will find you. It'll just, it'll find you wherever you are, right? And here's what I know about roosters, right? They, they don't just crow one time a day early in the morning when the sun rises. These jokers are crowing all day long. Like what, like, what is wrong with this rooster? All my nursery rhymes were lying to me. The roosters crow all the time, right? And so watch this. It wasn't just this one rooster at this one moment that made Peter feel bad. Peter heard roosters all day, every day. Every time Peter heard a rooster, I would imagine he's filled again with guilt and shame. I would imagine that sound, because Jesus told him that that sound was coming. Every time he heard that sound, he's reminded of how he failed Jesus. It was a sound that brought him low. It was a sound that brought him guilt. It was a sound that brought him shame. But all of a sudden we turn into Acts chapter 2 and the Bible says there's now a new sound. There's a new sound of the person of the Holy Spirit that is coming into this room. I say all that to say this. Listen to me. There is a sound that is greater than the sound of your past. And it's the sound of the Holy Spirit when he comes into your life. It, it's an encouraging sound. It's a faith-lifting sound. The sound that the Holy Spirit will bring into a person's life that is willing to receive him and, and, and allow him to lead and to guide their life. Boy, it's a sound that is filled with purpose. It's a sound that is filled with promise. It is a faith-building sound, this sound of the Holy Spirit. 
I've lived long enough to remember the old sound and I thank God for the new sound. I remember what the old sound used to do to me. I remember how the enemy used to use the old sound to bring me down, to keep me limited, to keep me full of shame and guilt. I I couldn't even step into my future because I was so busy still listening to the old sound, but thank God he brought a new sound. He brought a new sound into my life to replace the old sound. There's a sound that's greater than the sound of your past, and it's the sound of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says right here in verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Everyone say filled. I want you to take notice in John chapter 20. It's a left in your Bible, John 20 and verse 20, it says this. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Right now, this is Jesus. He's risen from the dead, and he's now showing himself uh, to his friends that he is alive. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, watch this. Peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, now follow me, follow, follow, uh, follow the timeline. Here we are in John chapter 20, and Jesus sees his friends. He breathes on them. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now we go to Acts chapter 2. 120 people are sitting in the upper room. They pray to receive the Holy Spirit, and now they're filled again with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. If you go to Acts chapter 4, there's another moment where they're there and they're praying, and the Bible says they're filled again. So, so, so watch this. I believe at a moment of conversion, at a moment of your salvation, when you say yes to Jesus, you pledge loyalty to Jesus. God, God, I, I want you to save me I, through grace and faith. God, it's this moment where we collide with Jesus and we are saved. In that moment of conversion, you are given the Holy Spirit. But I believe this, the Bible would lead us to believe that just because you were given the Holy Spirit at a moment of conversion does not mean that you do not also need to be filled again at other times in your life. And the Bible says that even for the disciples, Jesus in John 20, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. But yet we see other moments when they're filled again. They're filled again. I'm 35 years old. I grew up in a preacher's home. There's still moments in my life daily where I wake up in the morning and I just say, Lord, fill me again with your Holy Spirit. In fact, you want to, let me just, I'll I'll let you into my world. Here's what I do when I wake up in the morning. This is not a lie and this is not an over exaggeration. When I wake up in the morning, and I mean when my eyes open, before my feet hit the floor, before I grab my phone, before I grab my glasses, before I touch my wife, before I do anything like that, here's the very first thing I do in the morning when I open my eyes. I say, good morning, Holy Spirit. I pray that you would fill me today with your spirit fresh and new. Give me everything I need today to be effective. I'm not lying. I, I do this every morning. Actually, I, I, I started doing this, but then I felt bad because I wasn't saying good morning to the Father and to Jesus, and so I threw them in too. And so I, I, that, it's true. So now I just say good morning to all of them. But, um, but I do, Holy Spirit, give me everything I need today to be effective. It's like that daily bread stuff. Give me my daily bread that I need today. Holy Spirit, fill me today. If you're in here and you're a believer in Jesus, I'm thankful that you were given the Holy Spirit at that moment when you pledged loyalty to him, but you still need to be filled at other times in your life. You need to ask the Holy Spirit, fill me today. Give me what I need today because there's power that he wants to give you. He wants to continue to put a boldness and a courage in your life. Continue to fill me, Lord. I need you. I need your Holy Spirit. So what I want to do for the remaining of the time that we have uh, this evening is I want us to take a look at this moment of the early church being built. And let's take a look at how the church is built. So if you're taking notes, you want to write down a title. I know some people, it's like they can't sleep unless they get a title um, because their notes are not all together. And so if you need a title, um, just write down the Holy Spirit as promised. The Holy Spirit as promised. Jesus made a promise. He delivered on his promise. And the Holy Spirit was given, right? And so, uh, Father, in Jesus' name, once again, just uh, speak to us tonight, God. Speak to us off the pages of Scripture. Let us see things that we've never seen before. Uh, Holy Spirit, minister to us. Let us see how valuable you truly are for our life and our livelihood. And uh, Lord, I pray tonight that you would fill us again. Everyone who desires to be filled, God, that you would not leave one without being full. 
God, we, we, we are here for you. We're not here for great music or a great, t- this is not a TED Talk. God, we, we want to dive into scripture and we want your Holy Spirit to speak to us and fill us in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Like I said, I have, I have two boys, and um, as the father of two boys, uh, it gives me more uh, opportunity than I would probably like to build things around our house. I feel like Amazon is at our house like every other day with some new ridiculous toy that I have to put together. And I know in, in different houses, maybe that responsibility falls to the wife, it falls to the husband, whoever. In my house, it's kind of fallen to me. It's kind of like my responsibility. And, and, and so, you know, all these toys are showing up, tree houses and bicycles and, you know, all this Fisher Price stuff and whatever it is. And so it all comes to the house. And it, it's so funny because it all comes to the house. And I know a lot of you, you don't maybe have kids yet. And so maybe you're not familiar with it. But for those of us who do have kids, it's like whenever the box shows up at the house, it's always really interesting because there's always this like picture on the front of the box and when you look at it it's like this nice suburban little family and they're all like in their tailored outfits and like their nice little kid is out in the foreground playing on the toy and like their their lawn is completely manicured you know what I found out that's a lie that's a lie. There's no mom and dad that looks that put together after eight hours of building a bicycle. That doesn't happen, right? And, and, and so nevertheless, though, I open it up. I start to put all the pieces together, right? And a lot of times it's causing drama. If I'm honest, it causes drama between me and my wife, right, about putting this thing together. She's like, read the directions. I'm like, I'm, I'm a man. I don't need directions. I know how to put a bicycle. I know what a bicycle looks like, right? And so, so we're doing this thing together, and somehow I always get the handlebars backwards, whatever. And, and, and so, right, I'm building this thing. So in my house... The responsibility of building these items has fallen to me. It's kind of like in my job description as a dad right now. Watch this. Just like I have a job description in my home, the Holy Spirit has a job description. And one of his job descriptions is he is the builder of the church of Jesus Christ. Just like I build toys for my kids, it's part of my role. The Holy Spirit has a role. He's the builder of the church. Jesus is the lead architect. Jesus is the designer. The Holy Spirit is the builder. Now that should encourage every single believer in here tonight that this movement that we are a part of, if the Holy Spirit is the one building this thing called the church, then watch this, it's never going under. There's, there's nothing culture and society and the world can do to take out the church if the Holy Spirit is the one building it. Let me, let me wreck some of your minds right now. The church of Jesus Christ is not built on premier preachers. It is not built on talented, creative music. Like that's what we're led to believe these days. Oh, if you want to grow a church, you just got to get a good communicator and a good band. That's all you need, brother. No, no, no. The Bible says that if you're trying to build the house of the Lord and you're doing it without the Holy Spirit, you're doing it in vain and it's not going to last. How many more preachers need to fall in our generation before we'll wake up to the fact that it's not about who's the best on the mic? If the Holy Spirit doesn't build this, then we're all missing a really great dinner somewhere tonight. I could find something better to do with my Monday night if this is just about talented people getting together to put on some type of performance. But, but, but if it's about the Holy Spirit... And he's the builder. That changes everything. That changes it. I, I, I'm not a good enough, I'm not a creative enough communicator to change anyone's eternity in this room tonight. But the Holy Spirit can do that. Jesus can do that. The church is not built on talented people. Now thank God for talented people. Thank him for for, for amazing musicians and speakers and serving team members who have gifts and talents and, and they've seen the value and instead of just giving that all to, to the world and culture, they've seen the value of giving that to the house of God to build the kingdom. Thank God for people like that. But talent alone doesn't change anyone's life. We need the Holy Spirit. He's the builder of the church. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who do so labor in vain if the spirit of god is building this thing then it's never going under as a matter of fact when you look throughout history the more the enemy has tried to attack the church the more it's just grown and flourished like you would think he's learned by now just don't mess with it but 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 the more culture and society has tried to attack the church what's happened is the true church just continues to rise 
In fact, the Bible even tells us in the last days that though the world will grow darker and darker and darker, the church of Jesus Christ will just get brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. The Holy Spirit is the one building this thing. So let's take a look. Let's take some notes tonight uh, on uh, how the church is built. So number one, we're going to move through this quick. Um, Let me make sure I have my clock. Okay. Number one, the church is built on Jesus. It's built on Jesus. Jesus. Psalm 118 and 22, it says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, speaking of Jesus. And Ephesians chapter 2 and 19, it says, consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. But on the foundation, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. It's built on Jesus. 1 Peter 2 and 6, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. It's always only Jesus. The church is built on him. He's the cornerstone. He's the foundation. All other ground is sinking sand. If you are going to make it through this life and hold on to any chance of hope in the process, you would better have Jesus as your foundation. There's nothing else in this world that you can build your life upon. That, 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 can, that can even hold a candle. It is not remotely as stable and secure as building a life upon the person of Jesus Christ. And the church is built on him. It's built on the good news of Jesus. It's built on the finished work of the cross of Jesus. It's built on the tomb of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, the truth and grace of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the return of Jesus. The church is built on Jesus. It's not built on tradition. It's not built on religious duty. It's not built on rules. The church is not built on judgment. The church is not built on condemnation. It's built on Jesus. I mean, this whole thing that we're a part of, it's not even that, oh, we came to God. It's that God came to us. It's built on him. It's all built on Jesus. He's the solid rock. He's a firm foundation. It'll always be built on him. I was, a few years ago, I was at like an Easter service. I was walking around kind of the foyer area of our church. And you know how Easter is. I mean, like, it's like a lot of CEO Christians. You know, like, you know what that is? Like Christmas, Easter, and one other Sunday a year. Uh, probably Mother's Day. And, uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it, Easter has a lot of that type of individual who, who come to church that day. I don't know this guy. I don't know where, where he was with the Lord. But as I'm having a conversation with someone, I'm like eavesdropping. I hear this guy talking. And he was kind of telling his friend, he was like, oh, you know, like it's another Easter service, you know, and the pastor's going to get up there and he's going to, you know, preach about, preach about, you know, the cross and preach about the tomb and Jesus is alive. Like almost kind of like I heard this one before, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and listen, he needs to be stopped in some needs to say, hey, bro, what other message is there? (laughs) What else you got, man? It's the greatest story of all time that the God of heaven would want to put on flesh and blood and bone and actually come down here. He lived a sinless 33 years. You and I can't even live a sinless day. You can't even make it 24 hours. Jesus made it 33 years of a sinless life and he dies and he gets the keys to hell and he conquers death, the greatest and final enemy and he raises from the dead and he's preparing a place for you like, bro, do you have a better story? We can go to Starbucks, I'd love to hear it. (laughs) It's built on Jesus. It's the greatest story of all time. The gospel is built on him. The church is built on him. But number two, the church of Jesus Christ is built through people it's built on jesus but it's built through people isn't it crazy that the holy spirit would choose to use humanity in the building process of the church i feel like someone ought to go back to the beginning of this thing and be like hey man you're gonna want to pick something else i don't think you're gonna want to use these people because we have a tendency to commit ourselves to things very often and then not follow through with our commitments We're not exactly the most reliable species at all times. We have a lot of issues. We have a lot of flaw. Like you and I, like we know ourselves. I know me. And there's definitely been moments in my life where I'm like, God, I don't even know if you want to use me because I wouldn't even pick me right now. Right? It, It blows my mind that he would want to use us. He would want to build through us in the process of building the church of Jesus Christ. Like doesn't he know how flawed we are? Doesn't he know we tend to make mistakes? Doesn't he know we tend to not follow through? We have a lot of insufficiencies. When I look at my life, 
When I look at humanity, boy, we have a lot of insufficiencies, but I was reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when the Bible says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power, which comes from where? The Holy Spirit is made perfect in weakness. Watch this. God has sufficient grace for your insufficiencies. He has sufficient grace for your insufficiencies. Why use people to help build his church? Because even a human weakness cannot hinder the strength and perfection of the builder. The Holy Spirit, Jesus. For whatever is weak, as soon as Jesus fills it, it's no longer weak anymore. I believe the reason people are reluctant to allow the Holy Spirit to use them for the building of the church is because you know the truth about you. Like you can hide a lot of the truth about you from other people, but at the end of the day, when you put your head on the pillow at night, you know the, you know the things that are in the dark corners of your heart. You know the real you. And sometimes when someone's like, hey, God wants to use you, and you're like, yeah, you don't really know me. You know? And, and sometimes we're reluctant to want to be used. We're reluctant to want to raise our hand and volunteer. We're reluctant to want to go on a mission trip to the Middle East but because we feel like, man, there's probably other people that are a little more qualified for that. Uh, if, if you really knew the real me, you probably wouldn't want me to be involved in that kind of stuff. Listen, God knows it all anyway. There's nothing that you can hide from him. Have you ever tried to play hide-and-go-seek with little kids? It's awful. I got little kids. It's, it's awful. I'm, talking, I'm not talking like middle schoolers. I'm talking about like little kids, like little, little kids, right? You ever played hide and seek with a little kid? It's like, you know, you as the grown adult, it's like, all right, I'm going to go count. You go hide, right? So it's like I go over here, one, two, three. I turn around. Where's the kid? They're standing in the middle of the living room with their hands over their eyes. <laughs> Assuming that because they can't see you, you can't see them, right? And you're like, bro, I see you. I, you're, you're right, you're, in the, you're on the carpet. I see you right there. You're not even hiding. That's how silly you and I look when we try to hide stuff from God. We look like little kids in the middle of the living room playing hide and go seek. He knows it all anyway. He sees it all anyway. There's nothing that you're hiding from him. There's nothing that he does not already know. But watch this, knowing everything about you, knowing the thing that the friend sitting next to you doesn't even know about you, he still wants to use you in the building process of the church of Jesus Christ. It doesn't make sense, but he's extending this grace that is sufficient for every one of your insufficiencies. Everything you see about yourself that you're like, I don't like this about myself. I don't like that I did that in my past. I don't like that I participated in that. I don't, act, I don't like that I act like this. I don't like that I talk like this. I don't act like, I like that I behave like this. For all of those things, he has sufficient grace. And he still wants to use us anyway. He wants to use you. He's an advocate, the Bible says. The Holy Spirit's an advocate. He's a supporter. He's a helper. Have you ever tried to hide the truth about yourself? It's tough, man, when you try to hide the truth about yourself, man. It just brings so much anxiety. I remember seasons in my past where I tried to hide things, man. It's just, oh my gosh, it brings so much anxiety when you try to hide the truth. There was this moment I, when I was growing up, before we moved to Charleston, we lived in the upstate of South Carolina. I remember I was in this, I was in the, this neighborhood, and there was a lot of boys in elementary school that lived in our neighborhood. And that was back in the day when you could do sleepovers, right? I don't even know if really kids do that these days. The world's different. I don't know if you really hang out and do sleepovers. But we used to do sleepovers all the time, right? Every time Friday night would come, it'd be like, man, whose house are we sleeping over at? It was like that was the pinnacle of your life when you're in elementary school, a sleepover, right? There was one night I was sleeping over at my friend's house. His name was uh, the two brothers, Chase and Cody, and we were over at their house. We were in their playroom, man, upstairs, the playroom above the garage. And boy, we were just going hard all night, man. We were just living the dream, right? And we were just, I remember we were pounding soda like crazy. You know what I mean? That's what you do when you're a kid. You're like, ah, just pass me another one. Ah, you know, like this is what you did, right? This is what you did. You're crazy little kids, right? Pounding soda all Mountain Dew. Any Mountain Dew lovers out there? It's the nectar of heaven, isn't it? And so pounding Mountain Dews all night long, right? Playing, playing, playing. We eventually fall asleep. I fell asleep in the playroom on the couch, right? And it was one of those nights where I had one of those dreams. I don't know if you remember back when you were a little kid, but I had one of those dreams that like I actually woke up and went to the bathroom.
And it was so real, I thought I legit woke up and went to the bathroom. I didn't, though. But I had a dream that I did. And when I, when I actually woke up in the morning, the product of that dream was all over the front of my pants and all over that couch. I'm at my friends. I wake up. Now, no one else is awake yet. I'm the only one awake. I wake up. I see this. I'm a little kid, man. I freak out. I don't want to be made fun of. I don't want to be the kid that pees his pants at the sleepover. What do I do, man? I'm like, I'm, I'm immediately blaming everyone else. You just kept giving me Mount dues, man. This is your fault, right? And so I don't know what to do. No one else is awake yet. I get up and I just run out of the house. I run down the street to my house. I just go back to my, I don't know what else to do. I just go home. It's like 6 a.m. in the morning. I just go home. Like an hour later, like there's a knock on the door and my friend Chase, he comes to the door. And he's like, hey man, what happened to you? Like well, you weren't there when we woke up. I'm embarrassed. I, I don't want him to find out. I, I'm trying to hide the truth about man. I, I just, but, but I realize I'm caught. Like he, all, I, he knows what happened. You just got to own up to it, Clay. Be a man, be a, be a third grade man and just tell him right now what happened. Right? And I'm like, man, I'm too chase. I'm sorry, man. I was just, you would give me the Mountain Dews, man. I had this dream, and I just, it was your couch, and you know, all this kind of stuff. Chase looks me in the face. He goes, bro, it's okay. I just flipped the cushion. <laughs> I was like, come on, my man, right there, bro. Come on. Sometimes it pays to have an advocate that knows the truth about you, but still wants to be your friend anyway. Listen, the Holy Spirit is an advocate. He knows every truth about you. There's nothing you can hide from him, and he still wants to use you anyway. He still wants to use you to build the church of Jesus Christ. He still wants to use you to influence the sphere of life that you occupy. He still wants to use you to help get other people into the kingdom. He's an advocate. He knows the truth, and he still wants to use us. The church is built on Jesus. It's built through people. But number three, it's built by the Holy Spirit. On Jesus, through people, by the Holy Spirit. Now, depending on how you grew up in church, or maybe you didn't, depending on what you've seen, what you've read about, some of us, we got to demystify some things so that we can move forward. The Bible, obviously, is Holy Spirit. We, we talked about the Holy Spirit as God. He's an helper. He's an advocate that lives in us. Listen to me. Watch this. Follow me. The Holy Spirit's not weird. Watch. People are weird. The Holy Spirit's not weird. Sometimes, depending on how some of us grew up, we've seen weird people doing weird stuff. They've been like, oh, it's just the Spirit. No, it ain't. That ain't the, not that right there. I'm not too sure about that one, right? Like, I grew up in Pentecostal charismatic churches. Like, I've seen it all, right? And sometimes it's like, I'm not too sure about that. I'm not sure, right? And, and so now watch this though. Let me preface this. The Holy Spirit will at times push you out of your familiarity, want to push you out of your comfort zone. He wants to take you to a new level in your relationship with Jesus. He wants to get you into a deeper place of knowledge and maturity in God. And at times you're going to look at that and, and before you step off the ledge, you're going to go, I don't know about this. Seems a little out of my comfort zone. It is. And he wants to take you there, right? So you might think it's a, it's a little different. I'm a little cautious. Listen, that's okay, but he's leading you to a deeper place. But he's just not weird for the sake of being weird. People can be, though, at times. And I think we've all maybe seen people doing weird stuff, but the Holy Spirit isn't, isn't weird. I said it like this one, one time. I wrote this down. I, I thought this might be helpful. Jesus was the Father's gift for eternal life. The Holy Spirit was Jesus' gift for this life. I'll, I'll say that again. Jesus was the Father's gift for eternal life. The Holy Spirit was Jesus' gift for this life. He's a gift. He's a gift. Unpack the gift. Study the gift. Follow the gift. Be led by that gift who is the person of the Holy Spirit. So as the band gets ready to join me, there's just these four things that I want to rattle off that the Holy Spirit will do for you. The Holy Spirit will do, will bring into your life. Man, I can't even, I, I, I don't even know where I would be today if it wasn't for the person of the Holy Spirit. There's so many moments, like I said, every morning I, I speak to the Holy Spirit, I invite him into my day. 
I invite him into my life. But, 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 but the leading of the Holy Spirit, I look back at my life. Like I graduated high school on James Island. I go up to university in, in Anderson. And I have this moment. I'm playing basketball at Anderson University. I come home one night. This is how the Holy Spirit spoke to me. These are some of the moments. This isn't even in my notes. But I'm just going to share. I'm just going to be a little vulnerable. There was this moment I came home one night and I'm sitting in my dorm room. No one else is there. My roommate at that time, he had, I turned the TV on and he had left some DVD that was in the television set. It was a DVD, a worship DVD of Hillsong Church. And so I, I see this music. And in this DVD, I, I, I grew up in, in, a, in a church that we didn't have a, we didn't have a, a big young adult ministry like this in the, in the church that I grew up in. And so I, I wasn't surrounded by a lot of people that looked like me in my age who were passionately pursuing Jesus. And so I sit here, I just, I flick this on, I come home one night after a late practice and, and I turn this TV on and all of a sudden there's just this worship DVD and I see people who are my age and they're just passionately pursuing God. And as I just sit here and watch this, all I can say is that as I watched it, I just believed them. I really don't know what other words to articulate it other than I just believed what I saw. It felt genuine. It looked genuine. And at the end of this worship DVD, there was this promotional video for a leadership college, a Bible college in Sydney, Australia. And in that moment in Anderson, South Carolina, by myself in South Rouse Hall of Anderson College, now university, I sat there and I watched this promotional video for a Bible college and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, this is where you need to be. Ministry was the furthest thing from my, line, my, my, my mind. I was going to school to get my, my undergrad, and then I was going to South Carolina Law School with one of my best friends. That's what we were going to do. We were going to Columbia to go to law school. I wasn't going to be a vocational preacher. I didn't want to be a preacher. I didn't want to be a pastor, none of that. But yet the Holy Spirit meets me in this moment, and he says, go to Australia. I don't know anyone in Australia. This is very outside of my comfort zone. I don't, I don't, I don't tend to want to hang out with groups of people that I don't know anybody. But for whatever reason, I'm like, I, I call my mom like that night. It's like late. She's like, hey, what's up? I'm like, I just feel like I need to go to this Bible college in Australia. And she, being a pastor's wife, a pastor herself, she's, she's freaking out. She's like, this is amazing. I've been praying for this. I'm like, well, you never told me. So I go out to Australia, right? And get out there, do ministry school, end up meeting my wife, we come back, we, we, you know, we jump into ministry together. But, but I, I look at moments in my life like that and I just see the Holy Spirit speaking. I see the Holy Spirit leading. And I see the reward that was on the other side of me being obedient to the Holy Spirit. And I see, wow. The stuff that I had written down by way of plans for my life could have never gotten this good. Like the Holy Spirit was like, you're just, you were way ahead of me. You were way better than me. You know, one of the holy th things the Holy Spirit will do, the first one I wrote down is the Holy Spirit will immerse you. Watch this. If you invite him, he will immerse you. He will fill you. I'll say it like this. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman he will never invade where he's not invited. So if you want him, you need to invite him. And what he'll bring is not just power, but he'll bring a wisdom. He'll bring a leading that you're gonna wanna follow because it is better. The version of life that he sees for you and he wants to lead you into, it is better than your five-year plan that you have written down right now. He'll immerse you. Second thing he'll do is the Holy Spirit will instruct you. The Bible says in John chapter 14, it says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you, he's an instructor, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. The Holy Spirit wants to teach you. He wants to be your guide. He wants to be your helper. The Holy Spirit wants to instruct you to do things outside of your capacity. 
One of the things I love that it says right there is that the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance. Watch this. As you study God's word, as you're in moments of worship and teaching like we are tonight, the Bible literally says one of the things that will happen that the Holy Spirit does is when you're out and about in your normal life and you're just living life and all of a sudden you find yourself in a moment of conversation with someone, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is in moments like that, he will bring to your remembrance things that you have read about Jesus, heard about Jesus, moments of worship when he's been speaking to you, all of a sudden that stuff just starts to flood your mind. You're thinking like, I didn't make a note card for today of scriptures to encourage some. Where is this stuff coming from? It's coming from the Holy Spirit. He brings to remembrance the things that we've heard. There's been countless moments in my life where I walk up to someone and I'm just, I'm just out there living life, hoping to have a good day. Hey man, what's up? How's it going? And then all of a sudden someone drops a bomb on me. My wife's leaving me. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Wasn't expecting this conversation today. Mom's got cancer. Okay. Just, I kind of walked into that one. I wasn't really expecting that today. And all of a sudden in a conversation, this stuff just starts coming in my mind. Words of, of encouragement, words of, of, of affirmation to this person, Think scripture, prayer. Where, where's all this coming from? And the Holy Spirit is bringing it to me. What I've learned is if you'll step out, he'll meet you there. You'll be met in the moment if you'll just be obedient to the moment. He brings back to our remembrance. Another thing he does, the Bible says, is he leads you into all truth. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. Now, um, if you want to start a, like a Facebook debate war, just go onto any university campus these days and just get a group of people together and be like, hey, let's talk about truth. I hope you brought a snack because you will hear one million different opinions about what truth is these days. Oh, tr truth is just what I think it is right now. Truth is kind of relative. Everybody has their own truth. You got your truth. And she has her truth. I got my truth. Wrong, friend. Truth is not some relative, ambiguous concept. Truth is a person, and the person's name is Jesus. Truth is not just whatever I feel like it is that day. Truth has nothing to do with, well, black people have their truth, white people have their truth, Asian people have their truth, America has its truth, other nations have their truth. Truth is Jesus. Truth is Jesus. He will lead you into all truth. One of the Holy Spirit's main responsibility is he is always pointing people back to Jesus. He's like a big neon sign pointing to Jesus. There's Jesus. So watch this. If you ever see anyone and, and, and they're making a decision in their life and, and, and they're at a crossroads and should I do this or should I do that or, or whatever the case may be and they make a decision and they're, oh man, I feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me to do this. Listen, if whatever this is does not line up with the words of Christ, character of Christ in the, in the Bible, then no, it is not the Holy Spirit speaking to you because the Holy Spirit always points back to Jesus. I've seen people saying crazy stuff. They're like, I just feel like the Lord's leading me to do. No. I had a guy try to convince me one time. It was the Lord leading him to leave his wife, leave his family, move to a new place, just kind of start over. I feel like I'd be happier just for some. Listen, I believe a spirit is speaking to you. I just don't know that it's the Holy One. Because he never contradicts Jesus. He always points back to Jesus. He leads us into all truth. The Holy Spirit will impress upon you. Throughout the book of Acts, we see the disciples compelled by the Spirit to do things, minister to people, talk to people, help people. The question is not, will he impress upon me? The question is, will you be obedient when he does? The Holy Spirit will empower you. He will empower you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And power is just like a fancy churchy word, meaning given power. He wants to give you power. Like, give me power to do what? I'm glad you asked. He wants to give you power over the enemy. He wants to give you power over temptation. You know that thing in your life that you keep struggling with and you keep waking up the next day and you're like, ah, I'm gonna do better. I'm not gonna do that anymore. You know, and you, you feel guilt and you feel shame, but you're like, I'm just gonna pick myself up by my own bootstraps. I'm just gonna be better. No, you're not. You don't have the power to do it in your own. You're not strong enough for that, but you know who can help you overcome that? The Holy Spirit. Power to overcome temptation, power to overcome sin, power to love the unlovable, 
to serve your spouse one day, even when you don't feel like it. You've been given power to pray when you don't see results. You've been given power to do things outside of your comfort zone, power to fulfill the plan of God on your life. It's the Holy Spirit's power that has given Faith Church the ability to reach this community. It's only the Holy Spirit. Question tonight, the last one is this, is who is the Spirit for? The Bible says he fills all who are in Christ. When the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, it filled everyone in the room. Peter was in the room. Peter just denied Jesus three times, but he got filled with the Holy Spirit that day. Thomas was in the room. Sometimes I think Thomas gets a bad rap because like everyone, like I don't know who it was probably centuries ago who started labeling, oh, doubting Thomas. <laughs> like, How would you like that to be like your label? All throughout history, you had one moment of weakness and now everyone knows you as doubting Thomas. That kind of sucks. Thomas is in the room though. But you know what? Thomas got filled with the Spirit that day. So there's probably a lot of people in the room tonight, and you're carrying a label. You hide things from individuals. You, there's things maybe about you still that, that you don't want other people to know, and, and you feel like you're a poor candidate for being filled and used by God. But if you want to call upon the name of Jesus, he says, I'll fill anybody who wants to do that. So what I want us to do is why don't we stand to our feet all over the room tonight, And before we go out, have a great after party. There's gonna be some music and some free food and a lot of fun connecting with, with people, probably meeting some new people that you don't already know. And why don't you just close your eyes right, right where you're at. And I wanna, I wanna pray for some people right now who want to be filled with the Spirit. Now, it doesn't have to be everyone in the room. Maybe some people are like, I, I'm, still, look, I'm still testing the waters on all this church stuff. I get it. Hey, I get it. But for everyone, and I'm not saying you're not saved. That's not what I'm saying. Maybe someone in here tonight, though, does want to put their faith in Jesus Christ for the very first time. Maybe someone in here tonight is saying, man, tonight I want to place loyalty in Jesus. I've been loyal to a lot of other things in life. I want to, I want to renounce those things. I want to put loyalty on Jesus, in Jesus. So maybe there are people that need to do that and you'll be filled. But maybe it's just some people and you're like, man, I've, I've been a Christian for years and years. I grew up in church, went to Sunday school and, and, the, and the whole bit. But, but yet tonight, you need to be filled again. You need power again. You need wisdom. You need his leading. You need his guidance. You need him to lead you into all truth. You need him to bring to your remembrance the things that you know about Christ so that you can be more of an effective minister of the gospel in the sphere of life that you live in on a university campus, in your workplace, on a sports field, in your family, in your group of friends. You'll be better when it's the Holy Spirit filling you, helping you accomplish all of those things. So I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but I would just ask you to be bold enough on the count of three. Just lift your hand and say, that's me. I, I want to be filled. Holy Spirit, fill me. One, two, three. Holy Spirit, fill me. And I can't do all, all, all the work for you. So why don't you just maybe with your hand in the air, just open your mouth. You don't have to say it loud, but at least loud enough to hear yourself. Why don't you say, Spirit, fill me. I invite you in right now. Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me right now. Fill me right now. Give me everything I need to be effective for the kingdom of God. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your wisdom. Fill me with your discernment. God, fill me with the fruit that comes with you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, long-suffering. Fill me with everything that I need to be effective. Take a moment to repent if you need to. God, I repent for living life in days where, where I was not yielding to you, where I was not leaning on you, feeling like I had enough in and of myself to do it. God, I don't. I repent from, rec from, from, from not recognizing how much I needed you. God, fill me tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray right now. You see every life. You see every circumstance. Lord, come right now. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come fill. Sweep through every aisle, every road. Touch every individual that has their hand raised. God, fill them. Fill them in Jesus' name. I thank you that we can look back on moments like Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 where the Bible says that the Spirit came and all were filled. Fill them right now in Jesus' name. We need you. 
we need you. In the day and age we live in right now, God, we're not creative enough. We're not strong enough to do this on our own. God, we need you. We need you. God, we're we're, we're thankful that you want to, to build the church through us, but we will not be effective without the Holy Spirit. We need you. We need you. You, 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 uh, you can build, uh, the world and culture would lead you to believe that, that you could build a decent little family life and, and the American dream on your own. I'm here to tell you, you can't build anything substantial in your own home without the person of the Holy Spirit. Husband, you need the Holy Spirit. Wife, you need the Holy Spirit. Your kids need you to have the Holy Spirit. God, give us the Holy Spirit. God, when we walk into our homes and our apartments tonight or a dorm room or wherever we're at, God, I pray that as soon as we walk in as a carrier of the Holy Spirit, you would fill that place. I pray that every person who is not a believer, who might live under that same roof, God, they're going to recognize there's a difference in this establishment. It's because we've carried the Holy Spirit in there. The home's different. The living room's going to feel different. The kitchen is going to feel different because we've brought the Holy Spirit into that place. God, we thank you that you lead us. We thank you that you guide us.